we are going to read this blog post today and understand how Swiggy reduces their uh, significant amount of cost using Redis pipeline. Let's first see the outline of the video. So what we are going to cover is in brief, what is a DSP platform they're using? What is a feature store in that? What is it used for? What is a feature and how do they generate it? Where are they storing it? And how Redis writes are actually costing them 50 to 70 percent of the cost. Then we'll understand the working of Redis. We'll understand what's a sync versus uh, async API. What is pipelining? What is pipelining versus batching? Uh, what is a batch size? And why large batch sizes actually is not good? Uh, what is connection pool? Why we do actually use them? Uh, then we'll understand pipelining in different frameworks. Uh, Jedis for Java, uh, Node Redis for uh, Node.js. Then we'll see how they have used Jedis and uh, what wrapper they have created on top of Jedis. And finally, the result, how the performance actually improved when they use it, uh, Redis pipelining. And it has a lot more things what they have included in their post as I've covered everything in detail. So let's start with the blog post. So initially, they have mentioned something called a uh, DSP, which is data science platform, which actually they use for machine learning model deployment at scale. In that, they are actually using something called a feature store. Right. To understand this, we have to first understand what a feature is. A feature is something that's actually used to train a machine learning model. Now, let's take an example. Let's say we have a model that will predict if a user will order today or not. Now, to do that, a machine learning model will need something like features to train itself. Right. Let's take examples of some features. Let's say what we have is does a user order on Mondays. Let's say today is Monday and we want to see if a user will order today. So it will tell us uh, what is uh, the previous like in history that a user has ordered on Monday or not. Something like what is weather today? Will a user, does the user normally orders on this kind of a weather? Like these are features that will let machine learning model to train. Now now this feature store is actually where Swiggy stores all their features. Let's say I'm someone in the data science team, I've created a feature. Now someone else wants to use this feature. Now we already have a store where all the features are actually already been built. So we can actually use these features someone else has actually created. Now let's see in a little bit detail what actually it is. So let's actually see, they've actually shared this image. Now in this image, what we're seeing actually is a list of their features, right? This is one feature. This is another feature. So what they have initially is a name. So they give a name to the feature. They give, give a query to the feature. Name could be like ordered on Monday, right? Simple feature like that. Now then we have a query. So what they normally have, they will have the data that say order information in their actual database, like a MongoDB, uh, MySQL, Postgres, whatever like that. Then on that, on top of that, they'll be running actually this query and they'll be converting that original data into something they will call as a feature and will store it into a different database. In this case, they are storing into Hive, which is a persistent database, and also Redis for faster access. And they have also something called a TTL, which is time to live. It is like one or two days, because in one or two days, they will also get again, like hundreds of thousands of maybe millions of orders. And they, the data that we have stored in Redis or Hive, it is now old. They want to actually regenerate it again. So, let, so let's now go back. So that's also what they're uh, saying here, that feature store provide a simple interface to define and schedule the ETL. ETL means extracting, transforming, and loading. So extracting from their actual database, then transforming it, the query will be transforming it, and then loading into a different database like Hive and Redis. And they're actually using uh, AWS Elastic Cache, which is at then backed by Redis uh, as a feature store. Uh, Elastic Cache actually provides multiple Redis and Memcache and others, but they have used Redis. Now let's go down. Now, what they actually are saying, like there are thousands of feature jobs running every single day because like after one or two days, their data will be getting old. They have to run these features again, right? And this cost, they're like 40% of the total platform cost. This DSP platform, 40% of the cost goes to this feature job. And in that 50 to 70% of cost is going into writing to Redis, right? So it's obvious they will actually focus on improving the rights to Redis. To do that, what they've done, they've actually used this pipelining in Redis. Now let's first understand how actually Redis works. So let's say we have the server, which will be sending the commands to Redis. This is our server. And we have here the Redis. Now, our server will be sending some commands to Redis, right? Let's say set some uh, key equal to a value. Same the Swiggy will be doing. They'll be sending some commands to Redis. But what the problem was, they were sending actually every command separately, right? And what was called the problem? So let's say first how much time one request will take. So initially, it has to go from here to actually to the Redis and then also come back. And also there is some processing time which will take uh, in uh, Redis itself, which will be microseconds. But this is going to be milliseconds and that will add up. If we actually do it, we send uh, every single request uh, separately. It has to cross through the network, go to the Redis server, uh, process it, commit back, which is a very huge cost. And this is something called a uh, round trip time. And one more problem they were facing actually is when they actually were sending a request to Redis, they have to wait for the response to send a next request, right? If someone is coming from a JavaScript background, they might be saying, we'll be doing it like, why not use async programming kind of, let's send all the requests at the same time. Uh, the problem is in Java, we can't do that. We have to use multi-threading. If we act in the single thread, we can only use one request and we have to wait for the response to send a second request. So we have to use multi-threading to do that in Java. 
Now, how they solved the problem was actually sending these all requests in batches. They called it pipelining also. So let's actually now understand all the concepts that we want. So now let's understand first these concepts and then we'll move on. So let's actually go to this AWS documentation. So let's first understand what is uh, asynchronous versus synchronous API calling. So in synchronous API calling, when we make when a client make a request to the uh, server, it has to wait for the response to actually move on to any other task. If we talk about asynchronous, when they actually send a request to the server, they don't have to wait for the response. They have to they can actually move to any other task. Right. There is some kind of a queue going on in, in Node.js. Uh, you don't have to understand that. I'm sure uh, JavaScript people are able to understand that. So that's a basic idea of synchronous versus asynchronous. Let's understand what is connection pool and why do we use it? Let's let's go here. Let's maybe now let's say we have a client, we have a, a database, it could be Redis or anything, like a DB. Now, if we, let's say we don't have a connection pool. So what we have to normally do, uh, if any user comes in, like for every user, what we have to do, we have to create a connection, we have to maybe add some query and we have to close the connection for every user, or let's say for every thread, for every process, we'll be creating a new connection every time. And database has a limit, like every database has a limit of connections it can actually have. And then what we're doing is creating a TCP connection, right? And there is a limit of TCP connections in every single uh, server. So let's say we are letting every user, every process, every thread create its own connection. So there will be a time possibly that database will use all the connections and then the next connections is not possible. So we'll have errors and everything going on. So what is the best way to solve this is something called a connection pool. So we already have some pool of connections. Let's say we have 200 connections. Let's now say a process wants to kind of connect to the database. What they will do, they will actually take a connection of, uh, from this one, use it and then put it back. So they are using it. Now we only have 199 connections. Some other user comes in, it uses some other uh, actually uh, connection pool, connections from that, right? So now what they do when they're actually done with it, they will put back it into the pool. So at the end, we will have 200 connections and everybody can use and reuse them, right? Now let's understand what actually pipelining versus batching is. So in Redis documentation, it defines a pipeline as an ability to send multiple commands from the client to the server, right? And the server will be able to process all of them at the same time. Now there are two main ways to do that. One way is that we'll send all the, like a batch that we have, all the commands in the same network call. Let's say the batch size is thousand. So we're sending all the uh, thousand commands in the same network call and they refer it uh, as batching. And the second is that we're not sending them in a same uh, network request. We're sending them separately, but we're sending them at the same time. So we're not actually waiting for the response. So what we're doing here, we're using the async API uh, calling, right? And they are referring it as pipelining. Now what Swiggy actually have used, they have used batching. They're, they're calling it pipelining uh, in their terms. Now let's understand this question that I think comes in everybody's mind whenever they are using something like that. That what is a good batch size? And do we, and the and we talk about a larger batch size actually, is it better? Like <clears throat> we have heard everyone that the large batch size is not good. We shouldn't be using it. But what is the reason behind it? Let's understand actually the reason for it. So what is happening? Let me actually go down a little bit. <clears throat> so what do we have normally? We have a client again. We have a server again. So when we actually are talking about a batch, what a client has to do is has to kind of queue them all. Let's say uh, the batch size is 10,000. So uh, let's say the it is coming from some commands are coming from some kind of a queue. And what we have to do is we have to store them initially in some kind of an array, like in our, which will be in memory, right? And when the size of this is 10,000, it will actually go to the server to kind of process these commands. <clears throat> and then in this, and then in the server, which will be Redis here, what it has to do is also have a buffer for the response. So normally, let's say uh, there are 100,000, like 10,000 commands. Let's say it uh, processes the first command. Now the response, it is going to store it into some kind of a queue, a memory or a list, right? Now, because it has to send all of them at the same time. Now, until all the 10,000 are not complete, it can't send it. Again, it has to save it in the memory, right? So, so the problem with the bigger batch sizes, let's say we have 100,000 batch sizes. So now, in the client side, we have to store them into memory, all the 100,000 kind of requests and in uh, the commands here. And for the server, it has to save the 100,000 responses in the memory. Now, it is not just one client that will be connected to it. Let's say there are multiple clients connected to the same server and they all have the batch size 100,000. So what will happen sometime? It might even crash the server because <clears throat> what will happen if we have this 100,000, it's filling it in the same time some other comes in. So it has to have the uh, queue for that or the list for that also in the memory. Now, it could be like there are a lot of clients coming the request and the memory actually uh, got full, it crashes the server. So that is the reason we actually try to have some a decent amount of batch size instead of going like mad and just using some 100,000 and more. Like, so now let's move back here. So, so now you understand uh, what actually a larger batch size uh, can do. Uh, so till now, we understand how this batching actually increases this round trip time because we're sending all the commands at the same time in the same network call. Now let's understand how it will make the Redis perform even better.
So let's actually say we have this Redis, right? So normally if we send a single command, let's say we have a single command, what Redis has to do? It has to first read this command and it has to write this into somewhere in the memory, right? So what it has to do? It has to first go into read your uh, uh, command, then write it in somewhere in the memory. And if we are doing this one by one, like we send uh, all the commands one by one, it has to go for every single command, read it and write it into the memory, read this, write it into the memory. Now if we do this instead, we send all of them into a single batch. What it will do, it will actually pick maybe let's say 500, 200, however it may feels good, pick them, read it once and go into the memory and write all of them at the same time, right? It's kind of a context switch, right? So it's so it has to do a very less context switch instead of kind of doing it for every single uh, kind of command. So this also decreases the CPU uh, performance, like utilization and the performance also increases because of this. So batching doesn't only uh, decreases the RTT round trip time, it also decreases the processing time of uh, the Redis. Now let's see how actually we can do this in Node.js using this Node Redis uh, library. And there are three methods to it. One is this unbound conferencing. So what they're doing actually is sending all the 300,000 commands at the same time. The problem in that, uh, this is actually, uh, when actually they're actually doing this set this, there's a callback to it. In Node.js what it is, <clears throat> when we send a command, we actually wait, we, we put it into the queue. And uh, when this, let's say set commands uh, gives a success, then we'll run this callback. So what we're doing, we're actually storing this callback in a queue and what we will be doing if actually we send all of them at the same time we will have 300,000 uh, values in a queue that will be a very like a huge number and the heap will go overbound right and this will uh, cause a crash so this is not a best way to kind of handle this in Node.js. let's see the second method what they let's see how they are doing this using something called a bounding concurrency we are actually processing the same 300,000 requests but in the batches of 1000 so first actually they're running a loop they will actually send all of these send commands 1000 send commands initial send commands to the redis and when actually one of them succeeds we'll call this callback and it will add one another from this 300,000, right so let's maybe if you understand it this way so what do we have let me go here what do we have so let's say uh, this is actually redis and this is our server so now what we are doing actually uh, we are sending first thousand commands to redis and when one of them is done so for, uh, normally in node.js what we have all the callbacks will be in a queue like there's some kind of a queue and these uh, callbacks for all of these 10,000 will be in the queue so what will happen now when one of them actually is done it will return as a response and will run the callback of any of them and then in the callback what we are doing we're actually picking we already have let's say uh, 300,000 we're picking next one from it and then run it and, and then the callback of it will be actually uh, added into the queue so at the max in the queue there will be only thousand callbacks so right we have kind of fixed the number of it is so, something that they've said bounded the concurrency so i hope you understand how we are doing it here right so first running 1000 and then on every callback, we're actually adding a new entry into the queue. You can see that increasing the concurrency to 1000 has increased the request per second quite a lot. Like initially it was just 4500, now it's like 200,000. Let's understand the best approach. In Node.js what we are doing is we're first creating this batch object and then setting, uh, like adding the commands. It is set command, then we have this get command. Like in this we are only two, uh, but we can have a lot more. Like in uh, uh, Redis documentation, they say 10,000 is a decent uh, number. Then we actually add then execute it, which will be sending all of them at the same time. As you can see here, the batch size from two to 1000. Now the performance, as you can see, RPM, it is like 300, 300,000 and the even the CPU utilization is actually lesser. Initially, it actually, it was 100% as you can see here. Now actually, can, you can see it's only 75%. So we also decrease the CPU utilization and the RPM. Now let's move into the JDS uh, uh, library, which actually they are using. Now, as you can see, they're only actually given us the batching option here because uh, like JDS supports synchronous instead of async uh, calling, right? Now, what they've simply done, similarly, they've actually created a pipelining uh, object in there. There was a batch object. Uh, again, set a few commands on that and then run sync and then send it directly, uh, all of them at the same time to the Redis, right? Uh, now in JDS, as you can see, it is maybe even better than Node.js. Uh, for batch of 1000, actually what we have is 380. In there, it was 311 only and the, the CPU utilization is also better. Right. So this is how you understand for different libraries, how we can use it. Let's now move to uh, how they have used it. So initially what they are saying, uh, this is what they have actually uh, mentioned in the image that normally they will sending it uh, one by one, initially setting it and then getting the response, then sending a different uh, command. But in pipelining or batching, uh, in they are actually sending all of them at the same time in the same request, right? And it will be much faster than before.
Now let's see how they have used this Jadis library. First, they are saying they are actually using this in something called a cluster mode. Uh, in database term, it's called sharding. Uh, it means like breaking the data into multiple kind of shards. Like they are actually breaking the Redis. Like they have different clients. Uh, every uh, like client uh, Redis client have a separate data. Right. Uh, let's say they are separating it into the, depending on the countries. For India, they are storing it into one client. For some other country, they are storing it into other client. Right. <clears throat> now, what they are saying is actually in Jedis, uh, it was recently that they have supported in 4.0 version, uh, this uh, cluster modes. So, what they have done, they have actually created a wrapper on top of the uh, Jedis because it was not supporting a lot of things they were requiring. First thing is, they wanted a unified interface, uh, unified interface for both clustered and unclustered Jedis clients. Right. Second, they wanted support for auto synchronization of pipelining on configured batch size. We'll see that in just a minute. And then also a retry mechanism. Let's say uh, there some command fails. They want to retry it exponentially. So let's say first in one second, then two, then four, then eight, like that. So let so let's actually see what they have done. So they actually have this feature data, which is from coming from maybe some kind of a queue or something. It commands coming in. So what they have initially done? This is their service that they have created the wrapper. Initially, they have this something called a command buffer, like a list or something. In this, they have commands. So let's say they have a batch size of 10,000, right? Now the feature is coming in. Now until the bat, the, the list of the size of this, the length of this will be 10,000, they will not do anything. When it reaches 10,000, they have to flush this automatically to Redis, right? And when, if there is any kind of a failure <coughs> in the response, they have to first filter this, they will get a response, right, from the Redis, filter it and send it back into this command buffer. And then when it again reaches to 10,000, it will send that uh, batch, flush it to the Redis, and it will go on. So this is what they have done, created a wrapper on top of the JDS API. So this is end of their post. So let me go to back, what was the performance they actually got? So let's see here. So they actually said uh, their number of operations were like six, 36 million, which initially was taking them f like five and a half hour, now only 41 minutes. Uh, and I think if they increase the number of operations to 100 million, initially it was taking them 14 hours, now only 1.6. Now they're saying the time spent is actually reduced by 90% and the cost reduced by 60% and the, also the CPU utilization. As we can see here, their CPU utilization initially was like too much, like 25%. Now it is like around like 15% or so, right? So now I hope you understand everything about this blog post. Actually, I've added a lot more things. You can see there's only few things in the blog post. I've added everything that I feel it might help you to understand everything related to this uh, blog post, right? Uh, so I hope you liked it and do share and subscribe.